every now and then I like to research my favorite authors and Louisa May Alcott is absolutely one of them. Whenever people ask me weird bookish questions, which of course I love, things like which author would you most want to have tea with? I always say Louisa May Alcott because I just like her vibe, you know? I like her personality. And for that reason, I decided about a year ago, or maybe two, to sort of browse through one of her biographies. Now, I got that biography again and read my way through it, and I wanted to share some of the unknown facts, maybe you know, maybe you don't, about Louisa May Alcott and just sort of go through her life with you and get you to know the person behind the persona. As you probably know if you even clicked on this video, Louisa May Alcott is the author of Little Women, which is an autobiographical fiction which pretty much immortalized herself and her three sisters forever. This was one of the most popular books of the time, and it's one of the most well-known classics now. It's, it has a really special place in the hearts of lots of readers and families. For me in particular, I always have it on audiobook because weirdly enough, it just helps me with my anxiety. Like when I used to take the metro to work, I would pop in my earbuds if I was feeling anxious, and it would just work like magic. It's just a book that makes you feel like you're coming home and I think that's the magic in it. So that's the book that she's most well known for but let's go ahead and dive in to her as a person and how she got to where she was. Fact number one, Louisa May Alcott never wanted to write Little Women. Little Women was in fact the one book that she didn't want to write ever. It wasn't even really her idea. It was an idea from her publisher, Thomas Niles, and she probably wouldn't have written it ever if it weren't for the incessant pushing by her publisher and from the encouragement of her father, Bronson Alcott. She had no idea when she sat down to write in her bedroom at her little half moon desk that this work would be the one that catapulted her into fame and really rooted her success. Little Women was not Louisa's first book at all. When she first started writing, it was largely to support her family who were extremely poor for most of their lives. She wrote under a pen name and it was a lot of melodrama, danger, daring, murder, mayhem, and romance. All things that Louisa thought were much more exciting than a simple story about four young girls in their home. Later in life, she would write books of a more serious nature about her time as a Civil War nurse. So she basically had only written up to this point really fun, fantastical tales and quite serious ones. But Little Women, to her, seemed like a strange in-between and she just didn't see what the interest would be in such a simple story. But she was wrong and thank goodness she was because that book is so well loved and we might have never had it. Fact number two, Louisa was a lot like Joe, but to an extent. So just to clarify in case you don't know, but I'm sure you do, all the four girls in Little Women are based upon the real lives of the Alcotts in a sort of loose sense, and all of these sisters that Louisa had are represented in fiction. Joe is Louisa, Louisa is Joe. And of course they have a lot of traits in common. Louisa was an extremely rambunctious and independent child, especially for a young girl. She was very tomboyish and she just refused to be friends with anyone unless the boys proved adventurous and the girls weren't afraid to climb trees. That's just so, the sort of girl she was. She was prone to these little like rendezvous and escapes of her own invention. Like she would basically just run off and leave the house and at one of these ventures she got lost and had to be brought back by the town crier and at that point she was punished by her mother tying her to the sofa with a long rope so that she couldn't leave the house and she was so rambunctious that before the birth of one of her younger sisters her mother could not handle her and her energy and sent her off to live with a stern relative for six weeks until the baby was safely born. I think these a few little stories give you an idea of how Louisa was as a child. Those are a lot of traits that we see in her fictionalized persona, Joe. But the main difference is that Joe, as a fictional character, is often rewarded and praised and admired for her grit and her gumption. But in reality, Louisa was often chastised and punished for those same behaviors. So it's interesting that she took that independent spirit and celebrated it in her fictional work even though that wasn't quite the case in her own reality. 
Fact number three, and this one's very interesting, she was raised under very unique circumstances. We could spend a lot of time on this. <laughs> That's how in depth we could go, but I'll try to just give you the highlights of some of the strange sort of circumstances in which they were brought up. Now, most of the stories and most of just the way the Alcott family was and was run was because of the patriarch, Bronson Alcott. As you probably know, the Alcotts were transcendentalists and Bronson himself was a man who is either admired or despised depending on who you asked. He was a very polarizing man and there's actually a lot of biographies about him specifically. He's very interesting and it's almost like you can't decide if you like him or you just think he's nuts. The main thing to know about Bronson is, of course he was an idealist and that came into a lot of things, but how he got his start was he was actually a teacher. At first, that went very well for him and he was really prized because he had a mindset about children that was extremely different to the times. Back in the day, in the mid-1800s, children were largely thought of as just like, you know, horrible little minions that needed to be beaten into submission. Education was largely based on memorization and punishment. Bronson had an idea that was really revolutionary at the time, and I think a little too far. We needed a little somewhere in between there, but his idea was that children were closer to God because they were newer, and he thought that they were just little angels and that the world is what corrupted them. It's a really nice idea, but it, it's kind of impractical. A little fun fact for you is that he was very against spanking and would speak against it, but Louisa was so rambunctious that he spanked her even though he was against it, and I think that says something about how like independent and rambunctious and just full of life Louisa was as a child. So here's where it gets a little weird for the first time is that Bronson was prone to having like these sort of self-designed experiments and he would use his own children, the four girls, as sort of the hub of those. Now nothing like crazy violent or anything, but he was interested in um, morality and how that presented in children. So he would create these sort of strange little ways to test them and then make them feel terrible when they, you know, failed to live up to his godly expectations of them. So one example of that, there's a lot I'm sure, but one example is with an apple. So the Alcotts were extremely poor a lot of the time and they had interesting uh, beliefs about uh, what they ate and consumed, like their clothes were made of flax and they didn't eat sugar or tea or basically anything if it was made by slave labor. Another like great progressive point for the time where you're kind of like, yeah, Team Bronson, right? Because it's cool. Especially in the face of, I'm sure, lots of people who strongly disagreed and thought what he was doing was weird. So that's sort of like a check for yes. But then he would do things like this. There was a circumstance where he came in to where Anna and Louisa were sitting and had an apple in his hand and he basically gave them this huge lecture like you would never take something that wasn't yours would you and they're little they're like little girls at this point <laughs> and he's basically saying if you would take this you would be wrong and it would be terrible and he asks them Louisa would you ever take something that didn't belong to you and she said, of course not, daddy, you know, and Anna said the same thing. So then what they would do is dad and mom would leave the room, but they would leave the apple on the table and they would sort of watch in the wings and study what happened. It's kind of weird if you think about it. And Louisa would sort of go back and forth with their sister and they'd be staring at this apple and you know they're hungry, A, because they're children and because their family was extremely poor, like, Poor, poor, okay? So you know that an apple is probably a precious, delicious, sweet thing that a child would want. And it's all a test to see if Louisa and Anna can be godly, good little children like Bronson expects them to be. So what do you think happens? Of course, Louisa can't help herself, all right? And neither can Anna. Anna's actually the one who grabs the apple first. She takes a bite and then Louisa's like, they kind of tussle over it and it gets thrown into the fire. Louisa does not care. She goes into the ashes and gets that apple and eats it, ash and all. Now the parents have observed all of this and are sort of studying it and they come back into the room and they're like, oh, 
how could you? Where's my apple? Who ate it? And Louisa and Anna are both extremely honest children and they just fully confessed and they felt terrible because they couldn't control themselves at however young they were at the time and they just felt really bad about it because they had just said to their father, a man they loved and admired and saw as a hero, that they would never do such a thing and then they did it and he put them in that situation. It's just kind of a weird gray area, you know? He did the same thing later with Louisa by herself where he put an apple uh, like on the dresser in her room and then he went out behind the closed door and just listened and studied her while she's struggling and she's walking back and forth like saying how bad she is and that she just she just shouldn't do it, she shouldn't have it. She's talking to herself through this but she can't resist it in the end and when her father comes back in the room and questions her, she says, I had to have it, daddy. <laughs> so it's just like, why would you do that? It's just weird that he used his children in so many experiments, and those are just a few small examples. The Bronsons also did not believe in privacy at all within the family. All the girls were encouraged to have daily journals or diaries, but these diaries weren't for secret keeping or for personal meandering. Those diaries would be read and studied by mom and dad quite often because they were just curious about how children grew and their moral compass. Now on the one hand, that taught the girls something. It taught them how to write consistently and record their lives and think about them. On the other hand, some people might think it's weird that they would read their kids' journals. Some people might encourage it. And that, my friend, is a whole question of parenting that we're not going to get into. But take it as you will. It's definitely different. It's definitely different. <laughs> Bronson was an idealist and he was an experimental thinker, as many transcendentalists were. They did a lot of strange things and they had to move a lot because Bronson was essentially a failure at providing. His schools would get closed. For a little while, one of his schools was successful and instead of paying off debts that the family had already incurred, he just made more. He moved them into a bigger house and never paid off the old debts. So he basically dug them into a hole. Now at one point, people started to question some of his teachings and for one reason or another, his school was left and people, a lot of the richer society, stopped respecting him as a teacher and as a thinker. Ouch for Bronson, right? That had to hurt. So his fifth or sixth school closed and he kept trying to do this and he would just fail. He just could not provide for the family. And of course, in the mid 1800s, when basically the only way to provide for your family was as a man, uh, it was a little tricky for the Alcotts a lot of the time. It, a lot of the times they went hungry. A lot of the times uh, they suffered in clothing and cold and where they lived was a little rough. Even for a little while, they tried to live in a commune, which also failed, like a utopian society that they had an idea with some, with some other famous transcendentalists around them, and that also failed. So they have an extremely interesting, tumultuous life where they did a lot of things, they tried a lot of things. At one time, Bronson was trying to convince the family that he needed to leave to fulfill his spiritual journey, that he had to remove all bonds of familial ties in order to transcend. And Abba, his wife, and all the girls had to basically beg him to stay. It's just, it's just really interesting, and if you're at all fascinated by the psychology of Bronson, then I would totally recommend that you find some biographies on him, because he was an interesting guy. It's just that you can't decide if he's interesting, or you like him, or you hate him, and you're just not sure. I'm still not sure. Fact number four is that the Alcotts, though they were extremely poor, had a lot of famous friends who often saved their butts, from being sent to the poorhouse. They lived in Concord for many years. There was a break in between, but they did live in Concord a lot. And in that area were some of the best thinkers and literary figures of the time. We're talking Henry David Thoreau, Emerson, Nathaniel Hawthorne, I mean, we can keep going, Margaret Fuller. And these people were dear, dear friends of the Alcotts. So those are the sort of minds and conversations and heroes that Louisa would have had growing up. And those sentiments are really clearly seen in all of her works. And I just think that that is so fascinating that they could be so poor and in poorer society, but have friends with some of the best thinkers of the time. These are people who so strongly influence the world that a lot of how we think as a society today is due to their meanderings. That's just like, you know, mind blown. We're gonna jump ahead a little bit 
in time and go to fact number five when Louisa served as a Civil War nurse. So during the Civil War, Louisa traveled south to Washington, D.C., where she served as a nurse in the Union Hospital, which is a hospital that had only recently been converted to a hotel. It's said that one of the hospital wards still had a sign on the door, like a plaque that read ballroom. So probably not the best adapted hospital, especially in such a crazy time in the death tolls and what requirements people would have had for the mid 1800s during the Civil War and we did not know very much about medicine at that time really at all so you can just just let that ruminate in your mind for a moment on what that scene would have looked like. It was during this time that I think Louisa probably found the most profound purpose for the first time in her life where she felt like what she was doing had a lot of meaning. She was an extremely faithful, wonderful nurse to the men who needed her in a, in a terrible time, men who were almost guaranteed to die in this hospital. She would write letters to their families for them, she would read aloud to them, she would read Dickens, recite poetry. She was just a wonderful being to have around in that in those dark times for those men's life and there's a few stories and she did write a book on her time there called Hospital Sketches. I think you can get a true sense of Louise's character and who she was as a person at her core during the time that she spent at Union Hospital. That says a lot about a person about what they're able to contribute in times like that. However, it was not even six weeks before Louisa contracted pneumonia and then typhoid and became extremely, extremely ill. She would become so ill that her body would never be the same. Now Louisa, as you can tell from her rambunctious childhood and just her fortitude, was an extremely stubborn person. And she thought, I'll be fine. Let's not trouble anyone. I'm not gonna go home. It'll be okay. And of course she was surrounded by doctors. She probably felt relatively safe in the hospital. She would have known and been friendly with the doctors. She probably would have felt like you know, pretty comfortable as far as a person could be with pneumonia and then typhoid. They were treating her with something really common at the time. I think it's pronounced calomel, but I'm not quite sure. It's a mercury-based medicine. Of course, this is before we knew the poisoning of mercury and all the effects it could have, not only temporarily, but maybe for the rest of your life. So Louisa, with the mindset of the mid-1800s, thought, I'll be, go I'll be okay, but that was not the case. And it actually came to the point where people were writing to her parents and her family on her behalf, and Bronson had to come retrieve her. He found her extremely emaciated in a rat-infested room and took her home. Fact number six, Louisa May Alcott suffered from lifelong illness. So she's back from her time at the hospital now, but it's taking a long time for her to recover, as I'm sure was typical in the mid-1800s. Even though her family would have been doing their best and doing all they could for her, you have to remember that fever-reducing medication did not exist. And fevers could get so profound for people that they would have things called fever dreams, which were extremely strange experiences. For Louisa, they were often violent and absolutely horrifying hallucinations where she would really believe that these things were happening to her and not ever be able to escape them. One of the most memorable hallucinations that she would see was a Spaniard man. He was dressed in black velvet and he would appear in strange places like at the foot of her bed or in her closet or peering into her window once night fell. That's absolutely terrifying, am I right? And he would repeat one sentence to her over and over and over again. He would say, lie still, my dear. That is so freaky, you know? Like, I don't know if I could take it. So she would have these crazy fever dreams and it's just, I think in modern society, we forget how far medicine has really come and it's reading stories like that where you realize like, how do people do it? <laughs> you know, it's just, I can't imagine what other things she must have seen and hallucinated and believed were real in those fever dreams that probably stayed with her a very long time. If Louisa had been lucky, she would have eventually gotten over her fevers, been sort of like revived and felt good again by the love and care of her family, but unfortunately, Louisa was not that lucky. For the rest of her life, she would suffer from debilitating headaches, 
joint pain, uh, stomach issues, and she would get these horrible rashes on her skin. Sometimes she would just feel purely exhausted. And there's a lot of deliberation on why that was and why it occurred only after these illnesses of pneumonia and then typhoid. Some say it's probably due to the mercury poisoning because of the calomel treatment. Others say that the mercury would have left her system in a few years anyways, and that maybe it wasn't the lasting effects of mercury poisoning, but instead some sort of uh, immune disorder that Louisa might have developed later in life, like potentially lupus. We'll never really know what truly ailed Louisa, and neither would she. She spent the rest of her life struggling to find answers, to find relief for her pain, and she would never really find it. Like her father, she was an idealist and she was willing to try lots of new treatments of the, of the time, including like uh, mind therapy and just, she would try anything. And I think I relate to her on this bit just because I have a disorder in my stomach and intestines. And I just know that feeling of when you feel that bad, you will do anything. <laughs> to feel at least halfway normal again and it's hard for me to fully imagine how that must have been in a time when medicine really had not moved very far forward and that we really didn't understand a lot of things. Louisa's body was forever changed after the Civil War and, her, and the sicknesses she contracted there and that would be a running theme throughout the rest of her life. But that brings us to fact number seven which was that she was a slave to her own muse. Louisa wrote Little Women after the Civil War, and by the time she sat down to write, she was complaining of pains in her hands and her joints, and that she wanted to write, but she just couldn't find the courage. Now remember, she wasn't excited to write Little Women, and she would sort of avoid writing anything serious. She would just sort of write in her journal, or the house lists and things like that, or notes to friends, but she wouldn't really write anything for her work. She would avoid it at all costs, and then all of a sudden, a mood would hit her, and when that mood hit, she would forget to eat, she would forget to sleep, she would sort of just lock herself up and write and write and write. She called this sensation the vortex, and during these times her mother would bring her near endless cups of tea to the room where she wrote. Her father would deliver, of course, the occasional apple. It is said that some of her greatest literary inspiration came from Charles Dickens, who she admired extremely. She was very fond of the Pickwick Papers in particular, and she also loved the Bronte sisters. She adored Jane Eyre, and for her, the Bronte sisters sort of redefined what she thought a woman could or should write in 1868. I always find it interesting to know what, what other authors inspired some of the greats, and I just love that little tidbit. There were other authors she admired, of course, but definitely standouts were Dickens and the Bronte sisters. That leads us to fact number eight. She was surprised by her own fame. Now we've said this a few times already, but Louisa did not want to write Little Women. And in fact, when she delivered her first draft of about 400 pages in 1868 to Thomas Niles, her publisher, who was the one who wanted it written in the first place, neither of them were super impressed. They thought that the book lacked a defining narrative, but they were like, eh, let's prep for publication anyway, and that's what they did. So a few months later in August, the first proofs were delivered and Thomas Niles, the publisher, gave a copy to his niece, Lily. Lily ended up being the book's first fan. She, when she read it, she laughed and she cried and she just devoured the thing. She loved it, she adored it. And the letter started pouring in. It seemed that the book touched people young and old. It didn't matter. There was just something about it that people loved. Suddenly, Louisa had her first taste of fame, but it was really book two, Little Women. I'm not sure if you know this. I don't think most people do. Little Women, the book as it's sold now, is one Book, one edition but when it was originally published it was actually part one and part two they were separate publications so part two is what really made Louisa extremely famous and extremely wealthy I believe book two or part two tripled the number of sales that book one had initially had and people were basically obsessed with it of course paparazzi didn't really exist in the mid 1800s but it didn't matter paparazzi of today would have been replaced with 
fans who would sort of call on her house unexpectedly when she was in town, try to reach into her coach to talk to her when she drove past. There were dinners held in her honor. And all of this was just extremely unexpected to Louisa. And what's even better is that it never really affected her. It never really got to her. I think I've read some accounts that she would sometimes get annoyed by some of her fans, particularly fans who wanted Lori and Joe to end up together. She did not want that to happen. Louisa never married herself, though there were plenty of suitors and opportunities. And I think she wanted Joe to just have a different story, but she wanted Joe to get married on Louisa's terms, if that makes sense. And she wanted her to not marry Lori, the easy, easy choice, but to marry a poor professor with an accent. <laughs> and I just love that. So she loved a lot of her fans and she would get a lot of letters and she loved a lot of them, but she always detested the silly letters that she thought that some women would send to and being upset that Joe and Lori did not get together. Yes, even back in the day, people were complaining and fighting over who they shipped, okay? It's a thing. Regardless of all the attention though, Louisa, she was just always herself. She was still humble and independent, and though she would go to these dinners, and though she had more money than they had ever seen, she was still herself, and she was still a servant. She was always a servant to her family and to anyone in need. She was never saw herself as above or better than anyone. If anything, she felt I think she wrote in her journal after she paid off a lot of family's debts that had been long standing, a lot of debts that her father had incurred, that she felt, I've finally done it, we've paid off the debts and I could die happy. So I'm sure it must have felt really interesting to have for the first time the convenience and comfort of excess, but I just love that maybe it was how she was raised, maybe it was the strong values her father instilled in her, maybe it was just because her own life had been so poor and so hard for so long that she never lost sight of that. And I just love her. Fact number nine, she believed in family first even at her own detriment. Louisa was extremely dedicated to her family. She had no qualms about helping anyone out and in fact she did so extremely often. There were a lot of times in Louisa's life where she had opportunities or exciting avenues she wanted to explore, ideas she wanted to try, and for some reason or another, something would come up with a family and she would always put her own wants and desires on the back burner to care for the people she loved so much. Largely this is because, probably just because of Louisa's inherent nature, but also because she was the sole breadwinner for such a large family. Obviously her father had never really become anything, uh, though he did try a lot of different things. He never really was able to be financially successful in any real way. So a lot of the burdens of family, not only personal problems, but a lot of financial problems, fell to Louisa and she never complained about it. You know, she just took it in her stride. For example, she would write in her journal how she wanted to go to Europe and she kept planning it and planning it. One of her sisters was there and she never went because it was just always one thing or another. Maybe it was the inherent tumultuous nature of their lives that pulled them all together and made Louisa so dedicated. I mean, it's certainly true that tragedy touched the six of them more than it probably touched most people. The death of her sister, Lizzie, Beth in the book, is immortalized forever in fiction and honored in that way, and that happened when they were quite young and it struck them all very hard, but it would not be the last loss they suffered. Louisa's other sister, May, who is portrayed as Amy in the book, was in fact an artist and did some of the first initial drawings for the original publications of Little Women. She was actually getting a lot of success and fame as an artist, but in Europe. There she met a man, they got married, and she had a little girl. A little girl that she named in Louisa's honor. And everyone called the little girl Lulu to avoid confusion. So May is overseas, she's given birth to this beautiful little baby girl, and a few months later, for whatever reason, her body just started to rebel against her and unfortunately she passed away fairly quickly. Now even though Lulu had a healthy father overseas, May wanted it to be so that Lulu was willed to Louisa. So Lulu was shipped off to live in America with Louisa who would care for her and love her as her own daughter because remember Louisa never married and never had children of her own. Uh, she cared for her as if she was her own and really made her a member of their little family there of what was left. 
And sadly, that wasn't the last tragedy that struck them either. Now you will of course probably remember Meg from the book and from the films. Meg who married John. Now John was a man that Louisa loved very much and held in very high esteem. And that wasn't the case with a lot of men in Louisa's life. But she adored John. They all did. He must have been a truly wonderful man. John and Anne had two boys together and they were really happy for a long time, but unfortunately John passed away as well. And Louisa, along with all the grief that surrounded his death, because she was very close to him, they all were, now had three more people indebted to her who needed her support. And she didn't question it, you know? She just took it in her stride once again. I really wish I could tell you that that was the end of hard times for them, <laughs> but I can't. I think it just goes to show it's one of those things that sometimes people find success in their lives and they find wealth, but it doesn't always mean that you're guaranteed an easy road or happiness. And that was just unfortunately the case with the Alcotts. It wasn't too long later that Ava, the matriarch of the family, passed away in an upstairs room of the home that they all shared. And not long after that, it was Bronson's turn, her father. Our last fact, number 10, is that Louisa and her father Bronson had an extremely unique relationship. This is the sort of relationship I'm talking about that can really only exist when you have the blood bond of family and you've lived through everything together. At times they hated each other. At times they were their strictest, most trusted confidants. It was a really complex, tumultuous relationship, but what's important to note is that by the end, Louisa and Bronson were extremely close and the best of friends. We've talked before about some of the strange or questionable things that Bronson would do to Louisa or to her sisters in the sake of his own experiments and thought processes. And that wasn't just in their childhood. There were a lot of times where I really questioned Bronson's integrity as a man. Later in life, an example is that after the success of Little Women, he wanted Louisa to write a biography about him. You know? So it's just like, he's like a coattail writer in some ways, and I don't like that. And he had such a hard time with her as a child. You know, he had all these beliefs that children were inherently good and wonderful, holy beings. And Louisa just proved that wrong time and time again. She was an extremely difficult child for him to manage. And I think a lot of the times it was that they didn't understand each other or that they were so similar that he just couldn't take it. He just couldn't take the similarities, you know? People are weird like that. That's kind of how I imagine them is that they just had more in common than maybe they should have. And that affected their relationship sometimes in good ways and sometimes in bad ways. There are a lot of really interesting ways that Bronson and Louisa are tied together. For example, their birthday was on the same day and they would celebrate it together every year, November 29th. That's sort of like a weird little fact I can give you, um, but you could seriously write books on the dynamic of their relationship and the strange ways that they were connected. Sometimes it almost seems supernatural. Perhaps the best example I can give of that is actually how Bronson and Louisa both died. So Bronson is on his deathbed and Louisa comes to see him. She's leaning over her father and he's looking up at her from the bed and he says, I'm going up, come with me. Louisa looks down at her father, this man who's been friend and foe, hero and villain, and says, oh, I wish I could. Bronson just simply replied, come soon. I have to remember that Louisa has been struggling for a long time with her health. She'll go through phases where she feels okay for a little while, and then it'll happen again. At this point in her life, she's on a slight uptick. She thinks, maybe I can finally figure out how to feel good again. Health-wise for Louisa, things are looking up, but I just think it's interesting to note her reply to her father, oh, I wish that I could. I think that just says a lot about perhaps how Louisa was feeling about a long life, that perhaps maybe she was tired um, and ready in some ways. It wasn't long after the encounter with her father on his deathbed. He did not die right away. It was a few days later. So Louisa returned to her house and she was taking care of family matters as she always did. She was paying bills, she was writing notes to collectors, writing to-do lists, basically taking care of and nurturing the family that she had left. 
While Louisa is busying herself with the demands of the family, her father passes away. Louisa is not told immediately about her father's death. She doesn't know. So Louisa doesn't and would never know that her father had passed away. The day after her father died, Louisa woke up and she had a terrible headache that just felt like it was pressing down on her. She wrote a note to her sister to that effect and called the doctor. The doctor did not know what to do and so he just prescribed rest. So Louisa settled down into bed. She closed her eyes and very soon after slipped into a coma. She would pass away just five days after her father and in fact died the same day that his body was interred. They are buried next to one another. And that, my friend, is just a small glimpse into one incredible, humble life that Louisa May Alcott led. I hope it gives you an interesting perspective the next time you decide to read Little Women or watch the movie, think about the person behind the persona and the real family that was crafted beyond just a fictional book. Sometimes when I research authors, something happens where the veil is lifted, the mystery is removed, and I lose some respect for them in some ways. With Louisa May Alcott, I truly feel like it's the opposite. If anything, I adore her more. I think of her life and all she went through and how she dealt with it, took it in her stride, and she never complained. She was who she was unapologetically. And I think that's something to admire and look up to. So if you have a cup of tea nearby or water or anything, let's have ourselves a little cheers to Louisa <laughs> for giving us such an incredible book that I love, you probably love if you've watched it and made it this far and that has touched the hearts of so many people and continues to do so all these years later. Thanks so much for watching. If you liked this video, do me a favor, give it a big thumbs up and leave a comment below. I'd love to know which aspect you found most interesting about Louisa's life. And I'd also love to know what you thought of this video in general. I think I'm gonna plan on doing this as a repeating series for different authors and sort of give you a little look into their lives. I will link the books I used as I studied this, studied her life, so that you can check those out if you want to. Other than that, if you're new here and you haven't subscribed yet, but you like all the good bookish stuff, TBRs, wrap-ups, hauls, unhauls, all that good bookish goodness, then all you have to do is press that subscribe button and I'll see you on the next one. Thanks for watching guys. I'll see you on the next one.